It's great to see everyone this morning as we gather together to worship God, to to praise Him, and to think about some things from the Word of God. Glad to have our visitors, and we hope that you will stay after for our Bible class, and after that, stay around a little bit so we can get to know you just a little bit better. We're in the book of Zechariah once again. This is a continuation of last week's sermon as we were looking at the prophecies about Jesus Christ in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is the longest of all of the minor prophets, and uh, it's the next to the last book of the Old Testament, and it's closing out the revelation of God in the Old Testament. The only prophet that is left to look at will be the prophet Malachi, and Zechariah is a book of symbolism, a book of symbolic visions, in which the prophet Zechariah is shown some things that's very similar to the book of Revelation, as John on the Isle of Patmos was shown some visions that he wrote down by the inspiration of God. So we're looking at the book of Zechariah, and there are many, many prophecies about Christ in the book. Percentage-wise, more prophecies in the book of Zechariah than in any Old Testament book. So it's as if God, at the close of the revelation of the Old Testament, was emphasizing the Messiah is coming. That day of the Messiah is coming. Prepare yourself. And so God, through the prophet Zechariah, speaks of many things that we come to realize when we look into the New Testament and we see the fulfillment. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. God is saying here through the prophet, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now when you look at the context of Zechariah chapter 12, you go to the cha- uh, Zechariah 12 in verse 1 and find out that God is speaking here. God who created the heavens and the earth, created the spirit of man within him. God is the subject here as he is speaking concerning what will happen. And he says in Zechariah chapter 12 in verse 10, that on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out as we have seen from other prophecies of the Old Testament, as we have been going through every book of the Old Testament and looking at Christ in those books, we know that Jesus Christ would be of the family of King David. That King David was promised that his seed, his descendants, would produce a dynasty, a kingship that lasted throughout the end of Judah as a nation before they were carried in to Babylonian captivity. However, after the captivity, after they returned, they did not have a kingship per se from the house of David on earth. However, there would be a king that would come from the lineage of King David who would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He would sit upon the throne of David and he would rule over his kingdom forever. When we go into the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, we know and understand that David was prophesying about his own descendant, Jesus Christ. That he would be the one who would rule, who sat upon the throne and is ruling from heaven over his kingdom, which is the church. So it's going to be poured out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We know from other prophecies that Jerusalem would be the beginning point. That would be the beginning point of the church. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, Joel chapter 2, in which in Jerusalem, from Zion, the church would begin, and there the gospel would spread. So the spirit of grace and supplication was poured out in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost on the apostles as they began to preach the message of Jesus Christ. Also notice Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. 
In most translations, the M in me is capitalized. That's to indicate that deity is speaking. Remember the context, Zechariah 12 and verse 1, God is speaking. The one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who created the spirit of man within him is speaking. And God says here in Zechariah 12 and verse 10, they will look on me whom they have pierced. How can you pierce God? In John 4 and verse 24, Jesus said God is spirit. How can you pierce deity? Notice further in the prophecy. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and grieve him as one grieves for a firstborn. So God identifies himself as one who is pierced. They're going to look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him. Someone who is identified with God but distinct from God. How is that possible? Well, we know from other Old Testament passages that the Messiah, the Christ, that Jesus Christ would be divine, that he would be God himself. Remember Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, where God said through the prophet Isaiah, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the Messiah, the one that was going to be born in Bethlehem, the one whose goings forth, Micah told us, was from everlasting, would be God himself. He would share in the very nature of deity. And that's exactly what the New Testament tells us. As we go to John chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Literally the language says, God was the Word. God was Christ. Christ was God, and Christ was with God. When you take the totality of what the Bible says concerning God, the Bible makes it very clear that there is but one God, but God is not one person. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father would send forth God the Son. He would be mighty God. And that mighty God that would come into the world, Jesus Christ, the Word becoming flesh, John 1 and verse 14 would dwell among us and he would be pierced. God the Son, not God the Father, he wasn't pierced. Neither was God the Holy Spirit. He was not pierced. But was God the Son, Jesus Christ, was he pierced? Yes, indeed, we, we have seen prophecies where the crucifixion of Christ was depicted even before the method of execution by crucifixion was even invented. Psalm 22 and verse 16. Remember, this psalm is a psalm about Christ and about his suffering. It says in Psalm 22 and verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now David is speaking by inspiration here. And he says, they pierced my hands and my feet. He is depicting crucifixion long before that method of execution was even invented. Yet the saying his descendant would be executed. He would be surrounded by the ungodly. They would look at him. They would mock him as he was hanging on the cross. And he said they pierced the hands and the feet. So God was on the cross. Not God the Father, not God the Holy Spirit, but mighty God the Son was on the cross and they pierced his hands and his feet. Let's look at the fulfillment of that in John chapter 19. John chapter 19 verses 34 through 37. Not only did those nails pierce his hands and his feet in the process of crucifixion, his head was pierced by the thorns that were placed upon his head and also after his death his side was pierced John chapter 19 verses 34 through 37 but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out they opened up a fountain keep that in mind 
Blood and water came out when they pierced the side of Jesus Christ. He was already dead, but to make sure he was dead, they pierced his side and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. That's talking about John himself bearing witness to what actually happened. Verse 36, for these things were done that the spirit, that the scripture should be fulfilled. None not one of his bones shall be broken. That's from Psalm 34 and verse 20. And notice verse 37. And again, another scripture, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's a direct quotation from Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. They were looking upon the one whom they had pierced. And God said they would pierce me. Jesus Christ was divine. He wasn't just a human dying on the cross. He was the very Son of God dying on the cross. You know, He's going to come in judgment. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, it's very interesting. Revelation 1 and verse 7, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, even they who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. He's coming. He's coming with the clouds. And they that pierced him, those that executed him, they will see him. And the earth will mourn because of him. Zechariah chapter 13. When Christ was pierced, in the act of crucifixion, with that spear, Zechariah chapter 13, verses, verse 1, tells us that a fountain was open. A fountain. We know what a fountain is. We go to the mall or we go to a, an area, a park, and we see a fountain of water. And you know in mythology there is the, the belief in a fountain of youth. I believe there's a movie that's about to come out that's based on that concept. Perhaps it's already out. Based on the belief that there is a fountain of youth, that you can go to this fountain and drink and all your diseases be healed and you can live forever in a perpetual young state. But the fountain that we need is not a fountain of youth to heal our physical diseases. We need a fountain to cleanse us of sin Sin contaminates our soul. And there was a fountain open up outside of Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Sin is rebellion against God and it causes us to be unclean, contaminated. Sin is violation of God's will. When a person sins, they become contaminated and they cannot be in the presence of God until they are cleansed by that fountain that is open up. Also in verse 2 and 3, Zechariah chapter 13, it shall be in that day, talking about the day of Christianity, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Verse 3, it shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, you shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. We'll talk about verse 2 and 3 in just a moment. But let's talk about that fountain that was opened up. He was pierced and they looked upon the one whom they had pierced. We understand the importance of the blood of Christ as it came forth from him. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul the Apostle says that much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You see, we deserve wrath. We deserve to, to be placed into hell for all eternity. We deserve God's anger against us because of what we have done. But Jesus Christ sacrificed himself in our behalf, opening up a fountain for cleansing, 
for sin so that we might be saved. And we're justified, made right in the sight of God by the blood of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. That fountain that opened up is for the cleansing of our sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. It was the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. That blood is able to cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood is able to cleanse. We need to be cleansed in the sight of God and only the blood of Jesus can wash away our sins. And when a person becomes a Christian, when they're baptized into Christ, their sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. And I told Saul, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22 and verse 16. And as a person lives the Christian life, they're still in need of the blood. The blood doesn't stop at baptism. As we live the Christian life, we're going to sin from time to time out of weakness when we are tempted. And so we continue to walk in the light, confessing our sins with an attitude of repentance. And we're promised in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That is conditioned upon us. Walking in the light, walking in God's word, walking according to his commandments. We have the continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ when we confess our sins with an attitude of repentance. First John chapter five and verse six. Remember what happened when Jesus was speared, when he was on the cross? First John chapter five and verse six. John, the apostle, the one who I witnessed it, he saw it himself with his own eyes. He said, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. Blood and water came out of our Lord's side when he was pierced through with that spear. And we know that that blood and water was for a cleansing Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The most powerful stain that we will ever have happen to us will happen to our soul. And the most powerful cleansing agent to take it away is the blood of Christ. That's why that fountain was opened up in Jerusalem of the house of David, a fountain for cleansing. But also, in another sense, that opening up of the fountain of the blood of Christ in his death made it possible for us to partake of a fountain, a fountain of water. Revelation 21 and verse 6. Here is the fountain of youth For eternity. Here is the fountain. That we should drink of. When we partake of Christ. Revelation 21 and verse 6. He said to me it is done. I am the alpha. The omega. The beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water. Of life freely. To him who thirsts. The water of life. Made available through Jesus Christ. The alpha. The omega the beginning and the end. And whoever wishes, whoever desires, whoever thirsts can partake of that water and be saved for all eternity. Now, as we consider the other things in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 2 and 3, we have something interesting here. We find in Zechariah 13, 2 and 3, that we are told that there will come an end to idolatry, there will come an end to prophecy, And there will come an end to demon possession during the time of the New Testament. Well, we know that as the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire, that the Romans and the pagans, they involved themselves in idolatrous worship. 
But as, as the gospel began to spread, people began turning from idolatry to serve the true God. We have an example of that in the book of Acts, and we also have 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. As Paul is talking to the brethren at Thessalonica, it says, For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had uh, to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. These Thessalonians were idol worshipers. They worshipped those man-made gods. But then the gospel came in there and they heard the truth. They heard about the true God. They heard about His Son, Jesus Christ. And so they believed and obeyed that, so they turned from idols to serve the living God. And as Zechariah 13 says, He will cut off the name of idols from the land. That's what happened when the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire. Also, we know in the New Testament times, that you had demon possession. There was demon possession in the, the land because God allowed unclean spirits, demons, to possess people. Now you don't find demon possession in the Old Testament. But it's not until Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was on earth that God permitted demon possession. And He did that for a reason. He allowed people to be possessed by these unclean spirits so that Jesus Christ could show his power over them. Luke chapter 4 and verse 36, the people were amazed at Christ. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, What a word this is. For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So during that period of time when Christ was on earth, earth those uh, demons possess people and Jesus would cast them out, demonstrating his power over those unclean spirits, those demons. And even after the church began, you find demon possession and those casting them out. Acts chapter 8 and verse 7, Philip was casting out demons. And you find other examples of that in the book of Acts. It took a miracle for that to happen because what was happening was miraculous. A spirit Possessing someone was a miraculous activity, so it took a miracle for that to happen. I think I can safely say that no one today is being demon-possessed because it served a purpose. People say, well, what about all the evil in the world? What about these people who go crazy and they do the terrible things? Well, that's temptation. That's wickedness. That's evil in the world. When, when people, perhaps they have mental disorders and they do things that are uh, out of harmony with what is correct, that doesn't mean they're possessed by a demon. Demon possession is not the same thing as a mental disorder. We cannot confuse the two. Remember, for a person to be possessed by a demon, that is a miracle. And it would take a miracle to cast out that demon. Well, we know that those miraculous activities would come to an end. Zechariah chapter 13 says, concerning the prophets, he will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to depart from the land. So when those unclean spirits depart from the land, when there's no more demon possession, there's no more prophecy. And vice versa. When there's no more prophecy, when there's no more revelation being given, there's no more demon possession. Remember, it served a purpose to confirm the message that was being revealed. And we know that prophecy would come to an end when that which is perfect comes. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, makes it very clear that those spiritual gifts would come to an end. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. As Paul is talking about the supremacy of love, that you might have all these spiritual gifts, but if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. And he says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. I'm talking about spiritual gifts here. He says in verse 9, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. 
That which is in part refers to the prophecies, the speaking of tongues, and knowledge, which is referring to supernatural knowledge. That which is perfect has come. The completed revelation of God. In the 27 books of the New Testament, completing God's revelation to man from Genesis to Revelation. That which is perfect has come. Therefore, prophecy will not continue. And as it says in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 3, those who continue to say they prophesy, they are to be rejected. Because they're not prophesying. They're speaking lies. The only prophets that exist today are truly false prophets. There has not been a true prophet since the first century. We have everything that God wants us to know in this book. Revelation has been completed and God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in the scriptures, his word. Back to Zechariah chapter 13. We'll close with this verse. Many prophecies Many things in the book of Zechariah, but we're going to close with this one. Zechariah 13 and verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. This is a prophecy here about Jesus Christ, and we know that for a fact because Jesus quoted this when he told his disciples, you will all betray me. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. What happened when Jesus was arrested? The disciples scattered. What happened when Jesus was on trial? The disciples were gone. What happened when Jesus was crucified? Only John the Apostle was there because Jesus on the cross made provisions for his own mother and said, Son, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. Only John the Apostle was there. So the sheep, his disciples, scattered when the shepherd, Jesus Christ, was struck. We know that Jesus is the good shepherd from John chapter 10. He uses that imagery over and over again to describe himself as the one who shepherds his people. And if his sheep follow him, he will give them everlasting life. Also something interesting here in Zechariah 13 and verse 7. It says that this is my shepherd, God says, against the man who is my companion. Now notice, God is speaking here. And he says, my shepherd is my companion. That word companion in Hebrew is the word for equal. This again is emphasizing the deity of Christ. God is saying the one who is my shepherd is my equal. And we know from Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 through 11 that Christ was with God, that he was equal to the Father, but he humbled himself. And became a man to dwell among us. To die on the cross. So that we might have salvation. Christ in Zechariah. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. That song that we sung. Right before the lessons. Based on these prophecies that we're looking at in Zechariah. If there's anyone here this morning who has not availed themselves of the gospel message, we urge you to confess Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized, immersed in water so that blood can cleanse you, purify you, and He will add you to His church. If you've done that and gone astray, we urge you to repent and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.